I'll this meeting of the County Board of Education order. First order of business is to stand and say the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I apologize for my voice keeps going out. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Alma, would you please read our mission statement? I'd be pleased to. <coughs> the mission statement of the Upshur County Schools. The mission of the Upshur County Schools is to provide academic preparation, social responsibility, employability, and a desire of lifelong learning. Thank you, Dr. Alma. Let the clerk note that all members of the board are present. And we'll move on to approval of the agenda. <coughs> are there any adjustments to There are no adjustments. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda <coughs> as presented? Motion to approve. Second. Second. Dr. Wong. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Um, approval of the minutes. You'll have had a chance to read those from August the 7th special meeting and then our regular meeting. Yeah, I had a little question about the regular meeting, uh, just in the interest of, of history. I'm reading these later and wondering what in the <coughs> world's going on. Uh, on the last page of the uh, regular meeting, we talked about tabling the approval of the vendors because. Uh, Mr. Nanner spoke to the board requesting them to either approve or whatever it says there. It doesn't really seem clear to me why we decided to table it. <coughs> Seems like there ought to be some, uh, some, some clarity as to exactly why we decided to table <coughs> that and rebid. I see where you see that. I guess because it's all fresh in our minds. <laughs> I thought maybe perhaps uh, Mrs. Sisson could look back, listen to them again, and <coughs> determine, you know, exactly what the consensus was of why we had chose to table. Was it about the language being ambiguous? In some words, I mean, we began to quibble about words and mm -hmm. we didn't know <coughs> what we were saying exactly, what the, what the contract was saying. Ambiguity of the contract. I, I yeah, when, and, and we'll go back and do that and pull this tonight and, and redo it. But, but we, the, if you remember, the discussion was that we would, um, like you said, the ambiguity in, in the contract itself, and then we decided to have our attorney look at that contract and recreate that bid process and, and basically do it over again. So that's that's why it was tabled. Good point. Right, right, I do. I just I think, think so. there ought to be a little more clarity, yeah. I think. We'll be if someone goes back to read okay. that. So but we, we don't keep those minutes that she records, do we? Uh, we keep the recordings. Do, do you? Not? They're on my computer. <coughs> yeah. But they're not they're not filed with right. the minutes. This, this That's is correct. the written record that yes, people go back Yeah, we can. <coughs> so we'll pull that one <coughs> of the regular meeting. And, um, and we'll, um, do I hear approval for the special meeting? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, and then, <coughs> We'll bring those back next time mm -hmm. to be approved. Uh, move on to acknowledgments and uh, highlights. I um, had the opportunity and pleasure of attending all homecoming, not all homecoming events, but the major homecoming events, the coronation, the uh, parade, the foos, the football game, and the dance on Saturday night. And I'm here to tell you that that our students from Buchanan Upshur High School, the staff, the community, really uh, was just exceptional in their behavior. Very few incidents of, of discipline issues. The coronation, for those of you that were able to, to attend, I, I think you'd share with uh, my feelings, it was fantastic. Uh, Mr. Wilmoth and his staff is to be complimented, but mostly the students need to be complimented. And I appreciate Mr. Wilmoth leading that culture up there, and those kids were just fantastic. They were. I, I attended that, and it was just, it was so quiet during the whole thing. <laughs> it, it was. They, it was just very proud of them. Very proud of them. Uh, another announcement, we received a critical skills 
grant from the uh, West Virginia Department of Education in the amount of $84,000. This is, I believe, our third year of receiving such grant. It allows us to do some after-school services, and we're working on that plan now. And then we'll look later on to see if we would continue with our summer program. And this grant has assisted us in the past with that, so we're pleased with that $84,000. And then Buchanan Upshur High School, working with the student teacher, uh, received a grant in the amount of $3,500. The student teacher uh, worked on this last year while serving it at uh, the middle school, and it's to purchase 30 Kindles for a classroom there. And I think Ms. Samples has some mm. information about that too. I think it was a student in one of your classes. It was. Um, she was. She is in my class. She was in the upper class in the spring, and they write a grant. And they, if they don't have a classroom, they partner with. A teacher in the county, and um, she partnered with Bill Plymel, and it was through the Dollar General um, Literacy Foundation. And Thirty-five hundred dollars, and half the Kindles have already arrived, so it's been very a very quick turnaround. So mm -hmm. we're very, very proud. Of it. And that's what we have for announcements and highlights. Um, we'll move on to item seven, unfinished business. Um, Mr. Moran, some news. Yeah, I'll just give you. A Three things. There's other things inside the agenda that we're going to discuss anyway, but um, the MI <coughs> project's moving along. Um, Washington, as of this past weekend, uh, had them, them pretty much we're done. Um, they're going to do some finishing up work today and tomorrow, and they'll be um, technically moved out without doing the, you know, the punch list items will be what's left and, and that type of thing. And then we are having a construction meeting on Thursday to further discuss Hodgesville. Um, there was some information that they needed to bring to the table. They wanted to go back and, and when I say they, I mean the contractors wanted to go back and discuss. And, and so we'll continue that conversation on Thursday to see what what they would like to do as well as um, what we want to make sure they do. Um, and then if you noticed, uh, the, I applaud the uh, West Virginia Department of Highways down at the middle school. They, um, they've always had that issue where they pave the new road and where the parents make their loop. They, um, we've always had potholes along that road for that whole stretch. And uh, they took it upon themselves to come out and uh, basically make an eight foot swath that shoots down through and pushes it back um, to eliminate that. So. That was all their initiative, so I, I, we really appreciate what they've done uh, today. And I know it caused some inconveniences a little bit because of their little hang-ups that they had, but um, over the time frame, it'll definitely help us out with that little gravel lot there. So um, that's all I have for you, unless you <coughs> want to ask me some questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Financial budgetary items. George, you have I have a couple of things for you tonight. Uh, first of all, is some information from the West Virginia Department of Education about their budget. Uh, they've been asked, uh, as all state agencies have been, to, in looking at their fiscal year 14 budget, to uh, reduce their budget by 7.5%. Um, <coughs> most often, ba uh, the state aid formula is exempt from from some of these cuts, but um, the West Virginia Department of Education is looking at all of the things within their budget other than the state aid formula to try to arrive at these the cuts that they're required to come up with by the uh, state. However, if they can't find enough in the rest of their budget, it is conceivable that state aid could be cut somewhat less than 7.5% next year. Um, there's a uh, some a Supreme Court ruling a few years ago that state aid or the state aid formula had to be given preferential treatment in the budget, but that doesn't mean it can't be cut. So if they cut it less than what they're cutting everybody else, that's considered to be preferential treatment. Um, the other thing that they're, they're notifying us about is that it's possible with because the state has a shortfall shortfall in the current year's budget that there may be some mid-year reductions in various funding from the state. So we should be on the lookout for that. And then the third thing that they wanted to bring to our attention is that if you recall last summer, or I think it was last summer, when the, when the feds had their big budget battle, 
uh, their solution to that was that they put in some automatic um, funding cuts that were to take place starting January 1 of 2013 if they didn't do anything in, in the intervening time period. Well, January of 2013 is upon us and Congress has not done anything to, so there's gonna be budget cuts in, in the federal budget uh, coming up that unless something happens, and, and of course they're in such bad shape that I think there will be cuts, uh, which means maybe Title I, Special Ed, and some other things that we rely on for a lot of what we do. So that, that budgetary crunch is hitting us that we've been talking about for the last couple of years. Uh, the other thing I wanted to go over with you tonight, um, I think Superintendent Lampinen sent out to you a copy of the the file that's going to be published in the newspaper for last year's financials. Um, I'm required to have those done by uh, within 90 days after the close of the fiscal year. I'm still working on the notes and, the, and some of the other things that go in the big packet, and I'll come back to you at the next meeting and have that for you and go through that with you. But just a couple of highlights from, from the financial statements. <clears throat> As you know, they settled the OPEB issue with some legislation last spring. And a lot of that's reflected in these financial statements. Um, <clears throat> we got a $6.6 .6 million credit, with, and it's a, not a cash item, it's just a credit that we can use to reduce our liability. Uh, the accounting experts that, that the state hired to, to help with this said mm -hmm. that we had to put that on the face of our uh, income statement this year as an extraordinary item. So it looks like we had a big increase in our fund balance this year, which which we did, but uh, it's offsetting the the big uh, negatives we've had the last couple of years because we've been incurring that OPEB liability. Um, <clears throat> the uh, big item on the face of the financial statements this year is credits for 2008 through 2011 that they went back and decided that this was actually the state's liability, and that was the our 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 portion of that that was for state aid funded employees. We are still responsible for the non-state aid, state aid funded employees. I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> our current year expense for OPEB was three and a half million dollars. We got a current year credit for the state aid funded employees of $3.1 million. So in our financial statements this year is a $400,000 expense item for the, the other than state aid funded employees that we're responsible for. Um, there's a $1.3 million liability on our balance sheet for the other than state aid funded employees that, that we will be responsible for. We'll never have to pay this. It's the same as the old OPEB liability, and that will be paid over time through the PEIA payments that we make for individual employees over the next 30 years until that's fully funded. So at some point, that liability will continue to grow into the future, and at some point it'll start to come back down as that money is paid into the trust fund and it's funded. But it's gonna make our financial statements look a little bit funny for many, many years to come while that works through the process. So the bottom line is for our general fund. Um, if you take out the extraordinary item for OPEB, if you take out the $400,000 current year increase because of OPEB, we actually had a $217,000 increase in our fund balance from just all the other normal stuff that we do every year. So. Given that we had a $200,000 decrease in our budget, uh, I think that is, is a pretty good thing. Plus, we were able to, within the course of that, put some money towards the MIP project before it actually started. Uh, we were able to transfer some funds into that project to help pay for that. So that's included in that as well. So that may help you when you're talking about the MIP project we're proposing for next year uh, when, when you're asked to consider that. So. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I, I will come back with the full report later on and, and go through it in more detail. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Do I hear a um, motion to approve the financial items as presented? Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. <coughs> Consent agenda. <coughs> Excuse me. We have request to add the extracurricular trip driver and a request from uh, the Cannon Upshire High School, the FFA program. 
looks like they did last year, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, we'll move on to item 10, which is the addition to the uh, Fred Everly Technical Center. That's attachment E. <coughs> As you know, we share um, the modular building at Fred Everly Technical Center for our alternative program in our transitional school. So uh, this, is a, this project that we're going in with them is to allow us to enlarge that building and put an addition on it, basically, um, which will allow us to meet all fire marshal regulations so that we can once again have up to 30 children in that, in that program, as well as it, it holds to the future for Fred Everly that if we're ever not in that in that building, then they can use it for their adult education program too. And I think the key factor here is this is a, uh, a um, an agreement with both entities. And the total cost is about thirty-five thousand dollars, and we're we're asking that it, our part of it be for the HVAC and the fire alarm system, and not about nine thousand. And the the highlight of this is is that the students at Fred Everly Technical Center are going to do the addition. So this will be in lieu of the house that they typically build and, and sell, but this is going to put it right back into their own school and, and to assist us. And this was proposed at the um, Fred Everly Council last week and it was approved there and, and we're asking that our board approve it also so that we can move forward with that. And um, Keith, what was the anticipated time if they get if they get approval they can start moving on this right away. Well they've already started going right away. Right. Um, oh <laughs> and I don't want to say I don't want to say that just because uh, on their portion. On their portion. <laughs> okay. uh, they've already Not started needed or air conditioning. <laughs> no, no nowhere close yet for that. Um, but anticipation I believe um, that they would have everything enclosed by the time, you know, quote unquote winter sets in. Um, so that they can do the interior work on the addition. <coughs> It's, it's a separate building now. It's that modular building that's out behind Fred Everly. And that, that building had some fire marshal issues that we're going to address here. It also had some issues with part of the wall, and we've, we've assisted with them shoring that up, and then they're going to go and make sure that it's structurally sound. And then they have the addition of 654 square foot yeah. addition. And then it'll, what it'll become is an open, an entire open area. If you've ever been in there, when you first come in the door, there's a wall, and then it's these two separate locations. What it will provide them is a total open area for all students, so they can visualize and see them and, and instruct what they need to. And then the opposite side of the building, which they still use right now with students, will become like a one-on-one a -on -one area if they need to pull away from the actual tent. So um, th this whole project is, is you know, taken on and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, as I said, that Fred Everly, it's exactly what they want. The, the teachers and, and uh, everything there have been involved from day one, so um, it's spot on for them. And it's also something we need. Yes. Yes. Our yes. Kind of school, yes. transition school, yes. and those, those facilities have been below standard, actually, so we're going to be yes. upgrading that at the same time. So. Correct. Yes. Are we going to have to move during that process? <coughs> or, no? <coughs> All right. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the monies for the modular addition? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. All right. Um, we'll move on to <coughs> item 11, excuse me. <coughs> and that's the. Um, proposed major improvement project. And that's attachment. Well, I, I, have, have I have some supporting documentation for you. Um, and we have Mr. Shriver here and Keith here and, and George will talk in detail. But uh, it's time again to submit the major improvement project to the School Building Authority. We were fortunate enough last year in gaining a million dollars from them and a local share of a million, a little over a million of our share. And so we were able to do the electrical upgrades and the ceiling upgrades. So phase two of that project, as, we, as we've talked about, is now that the electric's in place, uh, we should be able to start working on our HVAC. So we'd like to propose that we uh, add the HVA systems at Rock Cave, French Creek, and Tenerton schools at this point. 
the initial, um, when we were initially we were talking about funding, we were talking about a million dollars from the school building authority and, and approximately a million of, of local funds. But as, the, as we look more and more into that, uh, those costs, those costs have gone up for our local share to about a million four. And uh, George and I looked at it, and George has looked at the books and, and feels that that is still good, um, a good investment if we can leverage a million four of our dollars to get a million and get those projects up and running. So what I have for you here is a draft letter which explains the projects as well as the cost estimates. And with that, I'll pass those out and then I'll turn it over to Ted and Keith to uh, talk through the, the details of that. Mr. Lampin explained it very well. Uh, it's that time of year the NSBA has two funding cycles. Um, October 1st is the first funding cycle for the MIP work and then November for their needs project. Um, you all were very successful in uh, your plan last year uh, in having multiple schools uh, being submitted for consideration. Uh, so it's um, likely that uh, they would uh, rank this very high again. In fact, Mr. Lampiner and uh, Keith have, have spoke to the representative and they feel that combining certain schools into one application is attractive to them as well. So um, it should rank very high with them. Of course, it's all on competition with 54 other counties around the state. But essentially, uh, it is HVAC replacements um, at the Rock Cave, uh, Tennerton, and French Creek schools. We were in a position where these are hard to repair anymore, right? Parts, they're so old that we can't even get right. parts to keep them up. Yeah, they, uh, most of the, uh, I call them through the wall units because that's what they are. They sit you know, under a chalkboard or under a window that are through the wall. Um, those have become obsolete. It's not a, a system that's used uh, very often uh, in a school environment. And uh, those companies are no longer manufacturing that exact unit or a lot of the replacement parts. Um, over the years, the uh, energy codes have changed um, so that's not the preferred system today as it was in 1987-88 I believe so they've served you well <laughs> what would the new units look like then we're still evaluating that whether they're on the roof whether they're a pipe system or a refrigerant system um, so that will <coughs> take place over the next several weeks um, in defining that. But we feel that these costs here are, are a good cost to, to put in a, a good system um, to meet the current codes. And these are the, these are the three schools where they actually work? I, you know, without me really sitting down and going through it. There are three schools in the CFP that um, we felt we needed to do it, you know, southern end and to, uh, didn't work our way this way. If you, uh, Rock Cave and Tennant are definitely the uh, two uh, that have the major issues most of the time since I've been here. Uh, Hodgesville is the other one uh, that we have some issues with, but <coughs> We're okay in, in most regards there, um, and there are you know moving the other part of the MIP to the summer, um, you know they're going to be tied up with that. So these are the three that, that basically made sense across the board that way. Can we salvage from parts left over? Well, I'm sure we we probably can. <laughs> no, there's, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, <coughs> well, that's the only question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? When you get your final figures in on what, what you're 
system you're going to use when you come back. Sure, that would delay that, so I'm just curious about what you're doing. Sure, we're glad to be there. But you don't have to have that for the SBA, right? They just yeah. want a ballpark there, right? That's what makes it somewhat fluid is you have to go to the SBA and then get, get their approval and then you start on the design. And, uh, but we, we're looking at those, all those alternatives, mm -hmm. but then you do the design phase after you know that you've got the commitment. So. Good to see you, Ted. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you for the cups. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, we, yeah, we do need a motion yeah. for that. Um, do I have a motion to approve the CMIP submission? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 All right. And we'll move on to Mr. Wager. Do you want to <laughs> first. Do have two sets of charts in here that I will share with you, and then I do want to explain the one chart that I have developed that hopefully I think the principals appreciate that we do. <clears throat> First of all, you're going to find two sets of charts, and after I start looking at my notes, I probably push the second set of charts should be the first set of charts. So um, I'm going to kind of switch those on you, and then I'll explain. Um, what I've given you there is the uh, No Child Left Behind data for the 2011 school year, uh, based on our tests in May of last year. The uh, 2011 testing year, we had six schools that did not make AYP out of nine. The good news is that this year, only four didn't make AYP. So we had two schools that hadn't made AYP that did. Uh, Rock Haven Tenerton hadn't made AYP the year before. And this year, they worked really hard. And not, they all worked hard. But uh, those two schools were able to get the areas that they had a concern in, moved up enough on the testing scores to make AYP. Buchanan Upshur High School, Buchanan Upshur Middle School, Buchanan Academy, and French Creek did not make AYP. Of those schools, uh, Buchanan Academy and French Creek are uh, Title I schools. Uh, so what that means is since French Creek is in its second year of not making AYP, if you remember last time I came flying in right before I came on uh, because I was at a school choice meeting. Uh, and what that means is if a school does not make AYP for two years in a row in their Title I, we have to offer the parents at French Creek and Buchanan Academy, because they have also been there on their third year now, the opportunity to transfer their child to a school that does make AYP or had made AYP. For Buchanan Academy, the two choices were Hodges Hill Elementary and Union that did make AYP. Uh, we had, uh, I sent out letters to every parent, 900 letters to both schools, all the parents, to invite them to a meeting if they were interested, uh, and to pick up an application if they would like to transfer their child. At the Buchanan Academy meeting this year, we had four parents come, and uh, one actually wanted to move their child after the meeting, and we explained everything, but there was no room in that grade. So that's the other caveat is, we can move your child there if there's room, but we're not going to move another child out in order to put your child in there that belongs at Union. So that's, that's what happened. At French Creek, we had, uh, I think I had eight parents show up for that meeting. It was more because they had never been in that situation before, and they were just wanting to understand what was going on. And of the eight that were there after the meeting, none chose to move their child. And then the next day, I got a call from a parent that didn't come who did want to move their child. So we had one child that moved from French Creek to Rock Cave Elementary for school choice. Now, because Buchanan Academy is in its third year of not making AYP, uh, we have to offer through Title I what's called SES, uh, Supplementary Educational Services. And I will be having a meeting in the next two weeks. I will be sending out another letter to every parent at the school 
offering the opportunity for their child to get tutoring. We have vendors that the state, a list of vendors that the state supplies. They have to be approved by the state first. <clears throat> I have got all those lists made, the letter to go out, and then we will have another informational meeting where I will meet with any parents that are interested in their tutoring. <coughs> what that means is the tutoring is not that we hire teachers in Upshur County to tutor kids after school. You have to be approved by the state, as I said. So what we have is a lot of them are online computer companies where the child would work at their computer at home after school uh, on, a, on a program that this company supplies. Or we have a comp companies like uh, Sylvan in Clarksburg that if the parents would like to take their child to Sylvan, uh, Title I pays the tuition. Title I pays it for any of those programs as long as the money lasts again. And uh, so we will offer it first semester and then in, in January we'll have another meeting and offer it again to any other parents. Um, and usually the tuition range is, is usually about $50 per session. So you can see uh, if they're going once a week or twice a week that that can add up after a while. <clears throat> but we will have those meetings and do what we're required to do by law. Would that, I'm sorry. Would, theoretically, would that help the school later on if those students benefited from oh, yeah. the Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the whole pass. purpose of it. Pass. And then again, and I forgot to add this also, with the school choice and with the SES, if we have a whole lot of parents that wish to send their child to Sylvan, for instance, then, and we only have so much money, then what we do is I will have to rank order all the children based on their West Test scores or in the primary grades on Dibbles and other testing that we do at the primary level. Plus, we also have to take into consideration whether the child is on uh, a low-income child or on free and reduced lunch. I have to compile that list and then we, we give the kids who are at the bottom of that list, the most needy, have the first opportunity. So that doesn't mean that just because you all, you're, you know, you got a child who's in the gifted program that would like to have that extra <coughs> stuff going on at home, on a computer, you know, and have us buy the program. Well, we're going to give it to these kids down here first before we give it to those. So that way we're helping the kids, as you said, that need it the most. Okay? Now, in that first set of charts that I show you, the NCLB, NCLB data, what you will see there is each school, at the top it will tell you whether they are on improvement, where it says need improvement. And then if you look on the right side, if it's got a check that they made AYP in that, in that subgroup, if it's got an X, that means they did not make it. So you can go through each school and see the different areas where they did not make it. Um, and then the number, what it is based on is the number enrolled. West Virginia has a, if in that first column where it says number enrolled for FAY, FAY means full academic year. If a child is only here for half a year, it doesn't count against us. Only the kids that start day one and are there when testing starts are included in our data. So that way, you know, if you have a kid that walks in the day before West test, you know, and maybe they were doing so well in the other place, it's not going to count against us. And you have to have at least 50 in that group and for it to count. That's where, you, where you're going to see a lot of NAs not applicable. That's because there's less than 50 in that subgroup. So in the bigger schools, obviously, they have more <coughs> subgroups that count against them. Okay. Whereas in the smaller schools, you'll have, uh, and nothing against our small schools because some of them are doing outstanding, um, they, they don't even have the low SES number, which is your free and reduced numbers. Because you're only counting third, fourth, and fifth in an elementary school. At the middle school, it's sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And for right now at the high school, and for the last few years, it's been just grade 11 that counts, even though ninth and tenth graders also take the test. Okay? So if you have any questions about that data, um, you'll see how they, it, there's a column, and I'm not, and I'm not, it's a lot of it's technical, and if anybody wants to read the technical, I brought in <laughs> the explanation because it's, sometimes it goes right over my head too. But it tells you uh, in the next to the last column, met assessment standard. If it's just a, if it's just a yes, that means they made it the way they're supposed to make it at that, at that score. 
the state gives them lots of opportunities for different ways to make um, AYP. They average, in some uh, respects, they will average the last three years for a subgroup, and if that brings their score up to making AYP, they make AYP. Confidence interval, which you see on that first page, is a whole technical thing. It has this whole big statistical chart and graph that if anybody would like to copy that to read, if you need to go to sleep and you can't, <laughs> it's good reading in that, in that respect. But um, you can see how the different schools and the way that they made AYP. So if you made it, what I tell the schools is if they made it with a confidence interval or under the um, um, averaging, anything other than the yes, that that's, that shows that they're close to not, they're close to not making AYP. So tell them that's when they need to go back and really work on those areas that they are close to not <clears throat> making AYP. And that's where the schools, especially at the elementary level and the Title I schools, we focus our instruction. It's not that we get away from the other instructions. That way, if we know our math scores have dropped, we're gonna really hit them in math, okay? Any questions about that? Okay. <clears throat> uh, then I wanted to show you this. If I could, and I'm sorry, you'll have to, you always have the table set up over here, so I thought, oh, this is going to be perfect. <laughs> and I'm going to turn that on white so I can explain this to you all. This is a chart that I have developed over the last, I don't know how many years, Bob, but been doing it for a while, to show that what I wanted to show uh, the schools, and the reason you only, usually I do a three-year trend data so that they can see how a grade has progressed from year to year. The idea is if you have a bunch of third graders and they scored at one number, oh great, of course it goes off that, uh, then you hope as fourth graders the teacher realize that and your scores go up. You have more kids making AYP. So I, and, but the only reason I did this only for two years this year is because 2011 and 2012 our, our uh, starting points did not change. <laughs> Every year before that, the starting points went up. We're supposed to be at 100% by 2014, unless we get the waiver, which I'll explain that in a little bit. So what I wanted them to see is, uh, and, and it also helps the principals so that they can tell that if they have a group that started at one level and dropped <clears throat> the next year, that we have to look at the reasons why they did that. Okay? And you also see trend. And so I've kind of... I'm bragging about Tennerton because they did an outstanding job this year. But it's kind of what, and the reason I have it color coded is because in 2011, this group, well, let's start with the math. 2011 in third grade, 65% of the kids made AYP at Tennerton. When they went to 2012, fourth graders, now they're fourth graders, 64%. So that means they're pretty, they're staying pretty much where they should be. They should be going up, but at least they're not dropping that much. Same with reading, we look at reading. 2011 is third graders, 50% made AYP, and in 2012, 56% made it. So they've had a gain there. So you can do that through everything, and that's why if you look at the green here, you look at the green here for the next year. So they went from fourth graders, went from 50% to 62% in, in math, and 52% and stayed the same in reading. So if I'm looking at this as, as, as a principal, you know, they, they would be saying, okay, we've got to get these kids to start, more kids going up here. Now, if we looked at this, and this was a 52%, and this said 40%, then we've got to look at, okay, what happened to these kids when they went to fifth grade? Is it something we didn't do in instruction? Then, uh, and I know Mrs. Uh, Waits has been doing a lot of work looking at the data. She meets with them uh, weekly. They have to come <coughs> up with... Uh, the, the areas that they haven't taught, they do the acuity, they make sure that if they haven't taught something or they thought they taught it and the kids didn't do well on it, they go back and reteach. She makes them go back and do that. So they've done a lot of work in that. And what I also did is the areas that were mainly affected in Upshur County are all students, low socioeconomic status, free and reduced, and special ed. She did not have the numbers of kids in special ed, so I didn't pull the data for her. I do for the high school, middle school, and Buchanan Academy because those are the three schools that have over 50 kids in special ed. <clears throat> so they can see it. 
But then, here's where you start getting some interesting data. As you look at, and for some reason, that's why you have Title I, because Title I says that low SES, poor kids do not get the same uh, advantages that all kids or your, your regular, whatever you call your paid kids get. Because if you look at the, all of the research, a child who is, whose family is very poor, have very little money, <coughs> barely can put food on the table, they're not going to have a whole lot of time to spend at night reading to their kids or working with their kids uh, on educational things. They're just trying to survive. That goes back to the uh, Ruby Payne training that we had gone to. So you look at here, and this was the area that Tatterton did not make AYP in 2011. Especially if you look at their reading scores, you have 50% of the kids in third grade over well, all of them making AYP, but only 29% of your poor kids. So that's a pretty huge gap. So the idea is to bring that up. But what I'd like to show you is what they did. They worked really hard, and their reading scores went from 29% as third graders to 41% of their free and reduced kids. They went from, this is still a little weak, but it was, a, it was still gain, from 20 as fourth graders to 29% as fifth graders. They had a little drop in the math, which they're working on. Look at their math from fourth to fifth. 24% made AYP to almost <coughs> half of them. So th this is data that I hope the principals share with their schools so that they can look at. And then it also tells, like I said before, if we look at a child in third, if we look at this group as third graders and they're 65%, and then we look at them as fourth graders, and as I said, they're only 30% made AYP, that means we need to go back and look at what happened in fourth grade. You know, we have some schools where there's a lot of transient, but not too much in Upshur County. So you can't tell all by even on, well, we got new kids, you know, we had a lot of move out. But we have to look at what we're doing with these kids that we're doing with these. And so that's the whole purpose of that that I do with them. So I've given you that information for each school. And I really would like you to go back when you have time to look at each school. And you can see where the areas that we have problems in at all the schools. And uh, when we do go to the um, growth model, I will come back and show you some really interesting uh, graphs that will be on there. Um, let me turn that light back on and cover this. Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, you have any questions about that? So we have, the, the thing is that it, it really shows the school is even if you made AYP and for, in 2011 and you still made AYP in 2012, if you have kids, a group of kids that are dropping as they're moving up from third to fifth or even sixth to eighth, ninth to eleventh, that's, you start having to look at why is that happening. They're supposed to be growing. The number percentage of kids making AYP is supposed to go up every year. So that's where we have a lot of concern. Do we look at the teacher? You know, and that's going to be part of the tied into their evaluations uh, in the future. And or is it the curriculum at that level, or are we missing something at that level that we did got it in the previous level? So it gives them a lot of data, and they get a whole lot of other data that they uh, uh, can use with all the testing stuff that comes back from uh, CTB. And I hope I didn't take too long on that. Really quickly, I want to go, I was just at the uh, county test coordinators meeting in Charleston last week, and uh, we have submitted, the state of West Virginia, I should say, has submitted a waiver of No Child Left Behind. And as of right now, I think they said 30 states have already been approved for a waiver. And the reason is, is because most, now that we're getting close to 2014, and in 2014, according to No Child Left Behind, everybody's supposed to be on level. And I think everybody's kind of finally realizing that that's not going to happen. And if we, were, if we wait two more years and we're supposed to be where we are, there won't be a school. There might be one or two. I think Pickens, because they don't have the numbers for anything, uh, or might make AYP. But otherwise, every county and every school in the state will not be, will be in trouble. And most almost every state in the United States would be in the same boat. And there are some ramifications to that. 
So what the state and a real, I could come back and get into this more, but just for a fast overview, what they've asked is, is to, instead of us using the AYP data and making that number go up each year to 100% and make all our schools feel like they're failing by 2014, we're gonna go to what's called a growth model. And uh, the principals now have access to that. The teachers have access to the growth model for their, in, their individual students in their class. We're going to have to go around and show them how to get to that data because it, it's not as easy as they told us it was going to be to get to it. But I'm going to go around and, and do some trainings for the, for the teachers and the principals. What that's going to do is say, for instance, uh, Buchanan Academy has been really working hard. And in most instances, every year, their test data has been going up. But it's still not, especially in special ed, it's not to where it's supposed to be. So even though from 2010 to 2011 to 2012, their scores have gone up, it's still below that level. So they're not making AYP. So as uh, Mrs. Skidmore was talking to me today about this, they were really, when they came back and found out they didn't make AYP again, they were really down. They were really distressed because they had worked so hard last year and the previous year. So what this is saying is that instead of penalizing schools that are still growing but haven't gotten to that point, they're going to uh, prioritize schools according to the growth that they've made. We're not going to penalize the schools that are still growing, but if a school flatlines or starts declining, they're going to start prioritizing those schools. And it does have some implications, especially for Title I. If it goes through, we will have, they will take the bottom 5% of all schools in the state, middle, elementary, high school. And those, I think, what did they say, Scott? It was 36 schools, 37 schools in the state. They will become priority schools. The state will come in to each one of those schools work with the schools, they'll have a committee that comes into every one of the, those 37 schools, work with them to see what they're doing from the LEA, from the SEA, the state, um, the level, and they will be called priority schools. Where the implication for Title I is, is that in this waiver, it says that they will get extra funding, the priority schools. Whether you're a Title I school or not, and we have, what did they say, seven high schools that they've already identified that will be in that bottom 30, 37. Okay, we do not serve middle and high school, and most Title I programs do not, because we've always been, since I've been in Title I, have been told that early intervention is the best. If you hit the kids early, hit them hard, hopefully they'll continue to progress. Doesn't always work, but we hope we're doing a fine job. So what they're saying is that we're gonna have to redirect Title I funds to those priority schools. So for instance, and I'm not saying they are, and I don't think either of our middle or high school are gonna be in there. They're not, they're progressing. But say for instance, the middle school was in that bottom 37. Well, then I have to serve the middle school as a Title I school, which uh, I've told you in the past, we get about 1.2 million. Most of it goes for salaries for teachers in our elementary schools. We're able to serve six out of seven elementary schools. If they become a priority school, I have to redirect funds to the middle school, which means we'll be cutting elementary schools from Title I services so that we can put more funding. Because to put years and years ago, when I first became Title I, well, right before I became Title I director, we had one Title I teacher at the middle school. And if you have one teacher, it's called a targeted school, so she could serve 30 students. Well, 30 students in a school of 890 or whatever is not is like hitting hitting missing, you know. So it wasn't very effective. So we pulled that program and put it into the elementary schools. So I'm just kind of telling you that's one of the implications that could come out of this. The other thing that's going to happen with this waiver is, remember I told you that in order for a subgroup to count, you have to have 50, 50 students in that subgroup. It will drop to 20. So right away, what's going to happen is that almost every school in the state 
will have almost all of the subgroups that we usually have for in West Virginia, the all <clears throat> low SES and special ed. Almost every school. I think they said that there would only be uh, seven, seven in their elementary schools that would not have 20 in the subgroup. And that's why I kind of threw out the word Pickens because they only have, I don't even think they have 20 kids in the, in the grades that count. So that's the implication there. Okay, and then the next 10% would be called focus schools. They will be your next prioritized schools. You don't particularly have to make them a Title I school, but we're gonna be doing, those will be identified schools for extra <clears throat> extra things from either the LEA or the uh, state, or the LEA. Any questions? <coughs> yes, sir. About data mining and getting this type of information for you and, and then for the superintendent, board members, and I guess the state too. Uh, I went to the Regional Education <coughs> Service Agency meeting last week, and mm -hmm. Dr. James Ferris of Randolph <coughs> County presented a computer program that looked like he could know instantly <coughs> The, the progress of any given student, whether they've been in school or not, or whether they're passing now or failed the test. I mean, if there's nine grades in a quarter, he, he knows that and, 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 and so forth. It, it looked like a very complete program. But his concern was that he wanted to own that and not the state of West Virginia. And then, mm -hmm. I guess, share from there, Randolph County in this case. I don't know if that's, it's not that long, is it? Yeah. In, in, no, in, we're, grade, we're in grade, I've in grade, been, in grade. It's called in grade. <coughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I've been talking with him about it. We're looking it seemed like a very nice program. I mean, for for, for right. purposes of this discussion, so you would know your most uh, needy student or school or teacher right. uh, sooner than later. Right. Um, and what's nice about this growth model is you'll be able to track those kids each year, and there'll be a beautiful graph that the, the teacher can pull up and it'll show every year that they took the West test all the way up to 11th grade. So if you've got an 11th grader and you want to see how he's done since third grade, if he has progressed, the teacher can pull it up, we can print it off, and uh, later on I'll come back and show you that once we've got it up and running. Plus you can, we can either e e see where each one of our schools in Upshur County compare to every other school in the state. There's a bubble, a bubble chart and it has high achieving, high growth schools, uh, low achieving, low growth, high achieving, low growth, uh, low, uh, low achieving, high growth. You know, so they can be in each one of those four quadrants. And what's nice is you go on there and all, all you see is our, our nine schools in, in white bubbles with every other school behind it in, in lighter bubbles. And if I run my mouse over to it, it'll tell me exactly what school it is. Mm -hmm. And you can see how they've done and which <coughs> quadrant they are in. So we have a couple schools that are actually in the high achieving, high growth model. We have uh, two schools that are in the high achieving but not growing model. So they're still making AYP, but they're not growing. So that means we have to look at those. Mm -hmm. So it, and I can come back and show you that mm -hmm. at another point too, once we've got that up and running. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take so long. When do we expect to hear about the waiver? Oh, oh I'm glad you brought that up. We were told, <laughs> we're not the federal government, is, that the federal go they asked the federal government, to w and it went in September 6th, and it goes to peer review, and they asked, the state asked that we know by December 1st because of riffing and personnel issues in West Virginia, because that becomes a big issue if we don't know till after the roofing session, I mean, you know, I don't know what we'll do in the meantime, but that's when we're supposed to know. We're hopeful of letting us know by this because of, like Roy said, the transfer and personnel season. Just a couple of comments on the on the improvement uh, in the growth model. Um, first of all, then, when the waiver goes through, if indeed the waiver goes through, we'll not be characterizing schools as making AYP or not making AYP. They'll be, they'll be designated as four levels, exemplary, meets standards, needs improvement, or priority. So that'll, that'll be good. So it'll take that burden of AYP as we're looking towards improvement. We really want to focus on, as we've talked about for many years, on that improvement. We want to, we want to continue to work on improvement for our kids and, and for our teachers. Um, and, and I think when, 
the reason so many states are doing the waivers is states as well as the federal government are realizing the fact that a school cannot be judged alone on one snapshot, one test, to say whether you're, you're a good school or, or you're not a good school. There are many, many good schools all over this country that are that perhaps may be struggling AYP-wise, but are making that, making that growth, and they're still good schools. So to characterize them <coughs> as failing schools, is, I think even the federal government's starting to recognize that. And that's why the current administration has, has offered these waivers to states, uh, because it, previously we weren't even permitted to do that. Um, the, we, we did make one error, um, and, I, and I confirmed it, it's 17 schools would be the priority schools, okay. and 37 schools if we were to use current data. So there would be 17 schools in the state of West Virginia that perhaps would be a priority, and 37 of those. And a majority of those 17 are middle schools and or high schools. Um, not very, there are few. And again, that data is not out. There's no, there's no secret hit list or anything, but that's if they were to use this, this current data. Um, and the growth model itself is, as Roy indicated, is, is going to be a nice indicator, not just for we, where we can see where each school is, but every individual child will have a graph of where they are, where they've been, and if they continue, what their trajectory will look like. If they continue on an average yearly uh, progress, then they could go to here. If they fall back, they could go to here. And so it's, it'll actually be some projections. Now the misnomer on the growth model is also that it's just going to be, gee, if you make growth then everything's okay. You're going to have to come up with a certain, um, and I won't call it a percentage, but there's an index that will apply to the growth itself. So there's going to have to be a certain level of growth also. It may be from where you started to where you are. But, um, so it's a misnomer to think that, gee, if we just make one, one more child reaches proficiency, then we've, then we're where we need. It's actually a pretty exciting time in, 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 uh, as we implement the core standards and go to the growth model. It's going to be an exciting time in education, that's for sure. Well, not having been on the board and I guess really not paying attention when the AYP was instituted, surely it wasn't set up for everyone to fail. I mean, what, what went wrong? Uh, in, in our limited view, in, in the, in, in the readings that what we've seen is everybody focused on hitting this certain cut score and by making uh, by holding people accountable for reading language arts uh, math and at certain states and social studies and science one of the things that happened in our own state is we kind of cut back on the humanities and the arts and in some states they're cutting those programs out altogether <coughs> You know, so, and I don't mean to get philosophical, but Socrates said there's three A's to a well-rounded education. Athletics, that's your phys ed. Aesthetics, that's your humanities and arts, and academics. And we've came, kind of slighted in our country those the other two A's, I think. So I think people are starting to come back to that and realize that. We focus so much on that, making that, that cut score. Now, we've, we have more children than ever making mastery but we also, if you look at our test data from the last several years, we have less kids at the distinguished level. So what we've done is we've we've, we've worked towards we we've, we've worked towards mastery, uh, and and absolutely we need to to bring those children up that aren't making mastery. But let's not forget the ones that have that have excelled over the years too. So I think the growth model will allow us to really focus on yeah, this. I think the growth model is much more realistic. It is. The NCLB from the start was based on unrealistic presumptions that all children were created equal. Right. And you, know, you wish they were, but we know they're not. And to think that everybody in the whole country is going to be proficient by 2014, if you give them this test and keep raising the bar, I mean, it would just got more ridiculous every year. So, I mean, I think it's just based on false assumptions. I will say one good thing for NCLB is the fact that it really, really did make us focus on the, on the things that matter. Uh, obviously, I'm all for the arts, being married to an art teacher, but uh, you know, we really, really started really looking at the, what made uh, a good reading program, what made a good math program, uh, going to the three-tier model of reading and really being able to focus on those kids and what the individual problems are and the members <laughs> and i think it helped to focus teachers i mean it yes. it brought to them i mean 
before <coughs> this idea of NCLB, I don't know that teachers really looked at that data. You were handed those test scores and right. you tried to, but people really didn't look at it or get into it. And I think that that's that's a good thing from NCLB as it forced people to look at that and see where they could go from there. Right. It added a focus on typically underserved populations. We, yeah. we know that. Sometimes we didn't take a long, hard look at, at some of our most needy. However, with that being said, we, we, we now have that laser-like focus there. That's where the growth model comes in. You're not holding them all to the same level of you have to achieve this because for some of our most at-risk students, their achievement is far higher than some of the ones that have already hit the cut score. So let's give them the benefit and, and work on that improvement. That doesn't mean we don't want to get them there, but we want to continue to, to, to grow. And that's why I think it's important to, to focus on improvement, improvement, improvement. We have to look at the, where we are and what we have to do to, to improve those scores, but we also have to look at improvement and growth. Good job, Roy. Thank you. Any other questions? Do you have some literature on the growth model that you can pass to me? Yes, and actually, if you go to the West Virginia Department of Education's website and on their homepage, there's a place that says uh, ESEA waiver. It's right there now, and if you click on it, it will give you a summary of it, or it will give you the whole document, which is 150, 60 pages long. Thank you. Uh huh. Thank you. And as you get further data, I think you'd like. To... All right, sure. Here that. Uh, you want item 13. You have the first reading. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the revised policy 5021, um, 9006, and 9007. Do you want to share anything on that? Um, basically, these were brought to our attention uh, that some changes needed to be made, so we went ahead and uh, put these forward. Um, some of the uh, issues that we've had here more recently with offering um, <coughs> students of younger. Um, Providers. Uh, there's been some questions, so we've built in some um, some changes that will help, um, I think, all, all parents with uh, getting their children off the bus. So uh, these three um, policies are, one's an old policy that's been renewed, and the other two are brand new policies. So. Policy G is the duties. We've uh, shifted that from just the, the old policy said just drivers. We want to make sure that all our transportation employees, mechanics, and whatnot are, are held to the same standards and responsibilities. The, the content really hasn't changed that much. Um, there is a paragraph at the end which is new about uh, reporting accurate information to the director of transportation. She needs that mileage and wear and tear and, and keeping your buses up and clean and running smoothly. Um, that's the major changes on that one. Um, policy uh, attachment H, 9006. This is a policy that's been in practice for the last couple of years but has never been codified in policy of, of, of where we drop off, how we drop off our young riders. Uh, it's always been in practice and is recommended that we use uh, through third grade, uh, that there must be someone at the bus stop, someone in the family or someone that the child is, that we have record that they can go with. There's been some incidents in the last few years, and some, some folks think that uh, perhaps a third grader, they don't have to go too far, might be able to walk to their, to their designated home if we know there's somebody in the house. We've had a couple situations where some people have been incapacitated, but we know that they're there. So we thought what we would do is, is write the caveat in there of if there's an extenuating circumstance and we view it to be okay, then we'll let that person sign a waiver so that their child could go. Uh, we all know that, men, that our children always make great judgments. It's always the other person's child that makes the bad judgment. Um, we, want, we wanted to be sure that there is room for judgment in there, and the Director of Transportation and myself will review those, those possible waivers and, and allow that to happen. So that, that's the, the main crux of, of that policy. And then the other one is just uh, 
policy 9007, talks about the FERPA laws, and now that we have audio and video on our buses, we have to be sure that we follow all the appropriate federal guidelines and laws when it comes to those things. Um, it's not as simple as we would like to, if there's misbehavior, there's something going on on a bus, it's not as simple as, gee, we'd like to bring mom and dad in and show them what was going on. If there's other children in there, then they're protected by the uh, protection of, of their educational records. So we, this policy has to be in place for, to protect that. We, we had an incident, this is just a, just a story about how well the teachers were teaching our daughter, Maria, but when she was about in third grade, um, she came home from school and harassly was at the house, but then got a call to see a sick child and it was one block away, which is where the office was. And so she said, well, I'm going to go over and see the sick child, I'll be right back. And Maria gave her a lecture and said, mother, you know you should not leave children alone. <laughs> <laughs> see, we might give her away. <laughs> So we would like to be able to put these out on first reading and comments and bring them back to the board with your permission. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go ahead. On, um, on G, all buses have assigned seats? They are supposed to have okay. assigned seats. I am given um, a sheet with each student's uh, name and seat where their assigned seat is for every bus. Now, since the bus driver has the discretion, that might come into me this morning, but by this afternoon, after 10 minutes on the trip, that might change yes. immediately. You up front, you back here, you over here. Okay. Uh, but <coughs> yes, yes. And, and I found with assigned seats, it. Uh, it helps with discipline. It keeps things a lot better under control. Uh, so it, it's it's I much just wasn't aware that yeah. Is. It's much better. It's much better that way. So uh, in the perfect world, allegedly, absolutely, every every driver is supposed to have assigned seats. And I check all those uh, uh, papers and assigned seat sheets that come in. So, yes. One of the things I, I, I did forget to mention on 906, when we, although we're not required to transport pre-K children, we do that to the best of our ability where we can. And when indeed we do that, then those children are assigned to the front of the bus. Yes. Uh, so that's what the <coughs> state recommendation and policy, and that, that's happening as we, yes, yes, now, that we wanted we to get that in the policy. The, we try to follow the guidelines of the federal government because they come on the head start. So, as I was nudged there, uh, not only are they on the front seat, but they also have uh, safety vest and harness. Uh, they must be harnessed in for all pre-K children. So that's not, every county does that, but <coughs> we do do it. We do do it. So, and if we can transport, if we can help a parent, then, then we will, because it's, it's important. Okay. Responsible for, and from what I've seen, they do an excellent job. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to personnel. So I had a chance to look at that. And do I hear a motion to approve personnel items? Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. <coughs> All right. And we have no delegations. Tonight, we on board member comments. I know in the paper that they've made a proclamation or something of that sort to kind of commission for retired educators this week. And so I think that uh, it would be fitting if we, if we too honor retired educators who went before us and made it proper Absolutely. for us to even be here, you know? Mm -hmm. So hats <coughs> off to retired educators. Was that in the paper? What was that in the paper? Actually, I, don't, I saw it on my, my iPod. Oh. <laughs> I don't read the paper paper. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank Anybody you. Anybody else? Yeah, it was in the office paper. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> I just want to say again, the coordination at the high school. Um, I'm not sure who put all that together, but they did an excellent job, and the kids need to be commended because they very well behaved. Um, very well. Um, our next meeting date is October the 9th uh, at 6 o'clock, <coughs> and we'll be at French Creek Elementary. Uh, we now go into executive session. Do you have a motion? Go motion. Ahead. motion to go into executive session for student discipline, West Virginia Code, section 69843. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. <coughs> We are now in executive session.